Today, I came up with a very beautiful and touching story of Martha. She is our subscriber and also a perfect friend of mine. Now, you will listen to the voice of Martha, and then I will continue the story. Hello. I have written my life story. I hope it does encourage and inspire anyone that had a rough childhood like I did. I only had my sister for support. I had no one else. I had very hard times of my life to get through it, but I had her in my life until she passed away. Then that day I was very sad. But anyhow, I hope you will click and subscribe to this person that is writing my, my story. And it's very important that you seek legal change of your name and gender to live successfully as a woman. You must also see a psychiatrist and an endocrinologist professionally too on your journey. I hope this story encourages you. My story begins when I turned five years old and after getting my birthday presents from my parents, I remember that I wouldn't say I liked some of the presents I got from them. I didn't care, especially the clothing they bought for me. It wasn't long after we ate my birthday cake and ice cream, and then my sister decided she wanted to give me the present I got my sister. She then took me aside and whispered, I need you to come to my room. I said okay, and I went to her room. She said, I'm going to give you a birthday present that you always have wanted. She said, I've seen this desire in you, and I even heard you when you was saying your prayers every night, and when I saw that you were in your room, that was asking and wishing that God would answer your prayers to be a real girl. And she's, remember, but I do not remember anything beyond this day earlier in my life. But she says she does remember when my aunt would dress me in girls' clothes and even remember the reason why she, I was. And that's when my sister told me that my aunt used to put me in her daughter's clothes because my mom really didn't give a lot of extra clothes. But that mom really did not have enough clothes for me when she babysit me when I was little now. I don't remember any of this, to be honest with you. So, anyhow, she told me that she was going to let me pick out the dress that I she knew that I wanted to wear. And I do remember asking her about how she knew which dress it was. And she said, I can tell by the way you look at me. And at first, I did not believe her that she was really going to let me wear her clothes. And that's when she said, it's be okay. And I know about you and how you've been praying to God and asking him to please change you into a real girl. And I know how you believe that God can't do that because God does not make mistakes. And I know you think he does, but try my best so I can help you feel much better about who you are. That's when went to her closet and picked out a green plaid dress with checkered stripes. And when she took it out of the closet, I was so happy because she was right. It was the dress I always wanted to wear. And she said I needed to wait a minute because I would need to wear the proper underclothing to go with it. I remember she had me a white pair of panties. I believe they were cotton because I knew that girls in our house did not get silk for my sisters until they were teenagers. She got me some white ruffled socks and Mary Jane shoes and I want to let you know that my sister was approximately five years older than me. Hence, her shoes were a little bit big for me. Still, I put them on anyhow with the lace socks and she rolled them down on my legs so I looked like a little girl after I put on her panties and slipped the dress over my head. The dress had no buttons or zippers so it just went over my head like a shirt. 
I remember how I felt so wonderful and how she made me feel so special on my birthday. That's when she told me that I needed to remember this forever, okay? And I said, all right, what do I need to remember? She told me that you were born a girl. I was never born a boy. I was just born with a congenital disability. And that's all it was. She always considered me a girl. You were and never have been my brother. To me, you will always be my sister. And I have been since the day I was born. And I will never forget that I was so happy. And we had fun together most of the night before my parents called us for supper. My sister knew I wished I didn't have to change my boy's clothes because she saw my sad face. Still, my sister knew my parents would never approve of it. And she was right about that because this wouldn't be the first time I would dress in my sister's clothes. I believe the next time I remember getting dressed in her clothes was when I was about six. We just got another babysitter and since she wasn't watching us, I headed to my sister's bedroom. We both knew that the lady was more interested in watching her soap operas than watching us. So again, Brenda picked out more stuff for me and helped me get dressed up again. Brenda was my older sister and did not play with dolls anymore. Still with me, we played with her dolls and she always let me pretend I was the mommy whenever we played together. Brenda knew I loved pretending to be the mommy because she knew my parents would punish and humiliate me, and both of my parents did this. I am sorry I will not describe what they did to me, but you probably can imagine some of the things that were done to me. This happened to me every time they caught me, and it was about the same time that I was an only cop by my parents because I even started getting caught by different members of my family. I do not know who exactly caught me first time, but I believe it was my mom. And when she did, she didn't find it humorous or funny. And I remember how she told my dad about it when he came home from work, and I was punished for it. Again, I will say only that about what happened to me, I will not describe how I was punished for any of punishments. And this was not the first time that I got caught wearing my sister's clothes. And I believe it was approximately almost a year after this. And I did not always getting caught by different family members. And they always told my parents when I was caught by them wearing my sister's clothes. And I remember being punished every time that I caught. And that's when my dad was tired of me wearing my sister's clothes. And it was that my dad that made his decision that I needed to see a psychiatrist. And this is when the psychiatrist began doing my conversion therapies. And again, I can't say what happens to a person during these sessions because it is not a fun experience for anyone to go through. But at least it's was only thing that he could do to me. But it's would have been worse if they could have given electric shock treatments. But this is illegal to do to anyone under the age of 18 years old. So this was not done to me. But if it was possible, my dad would have let them do it to me. And I remember that it was about this time in my life. Brenda came to me and asked me if wanted to stop wearing her clothes. And I replied to her and I said, this even if you tell me, I do not want you to ever wear your clothes again. That's not going to stop. And I'm just going to do it behind your back. Because there's no way. I can't stop wearing girls clothes. And that's, I have to be a girl. And I should have been born a girl. But I wasn't. And you don't know how sad this makes me. I told Brenda that this time in my life was also when I started doing things to my male equipment. Even though my sister called it a congenital disability. She knew I didn't particularly appreciate having it between my legs. I knew it did not belong on my body, and it wasn't long before I started doing things to it, and I would do what I needed to hide it to suppress it. I remember one time I even tried cutting it off, and when I was discovered then, 
I was rushed to the hospital for trying to do that, and I was back at home again. I was punished. But nothing I said mattered to the doctor and nurses of anything that I said at the hospital about it. I remember that I even tried using duct tape. One time, another time, I used super glue, and I also did other things to get rid of it. And this happened different times of my life when I was still a child. And it wasn't until my sister introduced me when I was 12 years old to my first panty girdle. Now I know that I am usually a medium-sized girl, but she instead got me a small size panty girdle. And you don't know how this gave me a more feminine look. Even when I had wear my own clothes, there was signs of me having any cojones. And I can't describe my feeling by seeing how smooth look that I had now. And just to let, you know, by the way, I was always small in size. Because of my chromosomes are XXY, and my psychiatrist required this test for me before she would even begin to prescribe my hormones or even recommend me to my endocrinologist. I am now. I'm getting ahead of myself before I even started seeing my psychiatrist because when I was 14 years old, I decided that needed to make some money. So I got a job and it wasn't long after my first paycheck that I started buying my own clothes to wear and I no longer needed to borrow my sister clothes or my cousin's clothes, or my niece's clothes. And this is the time that I intercepted clothes that were for my younger sister. And they were more than just a few times than I can remember doing this. And I knew that the clothes from my aunt, that they really going to be given to my sister Melody, who is approximately three years younger than me. So these clothes, so these clothes were a little bit big for her. And I found out that the clothes fit me very well. So before I got my job that I did not have an income. So now I had more clothes to wear because each time I took what I wanted from them. And no, I did not take them all. But I took a few things so I would have some girls to wear. When I was in my room alone, by the way, having your own room is really great to not to be disturbed by anyone. And my other brothers had their own room. Anyhow, my brother, Michael, was older than me, but younger than Brenda. And they both passed away, by the way. Brother passed away in 1991, and my big sister passed away in 2015. And I will tell you about that later in this story. So, when I got a restaurant dishwasher job, I began helping my mom do things around the house just like my other sisters had to do except for my little sister Jennifer, because she was too young anyway. My dad would not let me work outside with my brothers in the yard, whether it was mowing the grass, and I wouldn't trim the bushes or anything else that needed to be done outside. I was not allowed to do that. My job was to help my mom clean the house, cook dinner, and sew anything that needed to be mended. At first, she tried to teach me how to use the sewing machine, but I could not get it down where I could. It's not as easy as people think, even though my dad, Jack, did not call me his daughter. He treated me like I was. This was also about when dad bought a Polaroid camera and my brothers knew exactly where my dad kept it. I will never forget the first day my brother Michael took a picture of me wearing my sister's nightgown and panties. They knew I was wearing the panties, even though they didn't see them. They also knew that I was wearing my sister's training bra. Both of my brothers did not say anything and quietly said to each that they knew where I got the clothes from and they were my sister. So my brothers just told my parents about it at this time. And that's when my parents had a talk with Brenda about try to deterring me from wanting to wear her clothes. And, but she never said nothing, me about stopping me from wearing her clothes. And at times, most of my family members tried to convince her to talk to me about not letting me wear her clothes. And by not telling me, me how wrong it was. But she only pretended that she would talk to me about it 
but she never did. Now I know that I have clothes from the bags of clothing from my nieces that were supposed to be passing it on to my sisters. But I, since I didn't have my own nightgown, I borrowed one from my sisters, and I remember that was pretending to be a mom taking care of a baby at night, and I would only do this whenever I tried hiding from everyone, so I usually went in the utility room to wear my clothes, but it wasn't long before my brothers again discovered my secret. But this time, when my brothers found me, and that's when they decided to get the camera, without waking me up, to let me know that they found me again, and when they saw what I was wearing, and they did not say a word to me, and just quietly went and got the camera, and they were going to, now, have the proof of me wearing my sister's nightgown. And they always tried to catch me, so this time they wanted to make sure they took pictures of me. And they actually got three pictures of me before I knew what happened. And if wasn't for my brother Monty, that started laughing at me. Then they probably could have got more pictures because I wasn't paying attention. And I was to focus sleeping with my doll, which is what I had in my arms. One thing about this camera is that you don't have to wait long before. These pictures are automatically developed within a minute after taking them. They didn't wait very long before they began to show it to all the students in my class, and I could not deny it. So it was not only the boys who teased me, but the girls who did, too. This continued for a while. I think it was only about two grades in school that I was teased, and my brothers decided this was not enough. They ensured that when we were at church, they wanted to show everyone these pictures. I mean, they showed everyone the pictures. After this happened, I was not allowed to attend any of my students' birthday parties or any events the neighborhood was having when their parents saw the pictures. You can imagine the words that they began to call me. I will not tell you those words. I remember how one day I messed up and I left one of my skirts that wore whenever I could anyway. I left it out on my and, forgot to put back into my hiding place in my room. And when my mom did see it, that when she began to search my whole room and she found everything that I had and then she burned it all of my stuff. And this called a purge that she did and she destroyed everything that was girl stuff. And this was the first time and last time that she never found any of my girl's clothing since I was working already and I had a paycheck coming in. I had to start to buy my own clothes because my mom made sure if my aunt giving my sister any clothes that she would get them so I did not get any of them. And then my mom would give them to my sister personally. Something about my sister Brenda that you probably didn't know that she did have cerebral palsy and that she was pretty much confined to her wheelchair and she really depended upon my parents taking care of her. It wouldn't be till years later when I would be her caregiver. But again, I was getting ahead of myself. Brenda would go to the stores with my mom and buy clothing for me. My mom didn't know that she was buying clothes for me. So, she thought it was for Brenda and she even bought my shoes because Brenda knew what my size shoes were that I needed. I remember one of them being a white pair of shoes with three inch heels and I love those shoes very much too. She also bought me some pantyhose and more panty girdles to suppress my, you know what, like I said, I was always small, which gave me a girly look. It gave me the look of having a smooth area with no bulge and I remember that this was about when my parents divorced each other. I blame myself because I would not stop wearing girls clothes. Still, I knew that I couldn't ever stop. It didn't matter to me whose clothes they were. So if it was my sisters, nieces, cousins, aunts, or even my mom's, I wanted it to be a girl. I knew that there was no way I could stop because I love wearing them as much as possible. I did it secretly 
because I did not want to get caught again. I did get away with it most of the time. Still, I did have a few close calls a couple of times, and if I was about to get caught, still, I was prepared to hide everything away in time just in case they came home before I was expecting them. Anyhow, my mom decided to marry my stepfather, who had just recently been released from prison. Still, I want you to know about it because it is a part of my life, and it's the reason why, at 16, I tried to end my life. I remember the day it started, which was very well in my mind. It was November 17, 1977. While my mom was at her job, my stepdad came into my room and began removing the clothes off my body, except for my top, which I was wearing, which was a blouse, because I was not expecting him to come home when he did. I was wearing a skirt, with that blouse at the time, pantyhose, panties, and a bra, which, by the way, I used softballs to stuff my bra with, and I know they're not the greatest for boobs, but that's what I had to use. I didn't know that I could have used socks or something else. There was something about using the softballs because they gave me the feel of having my breasts. Maybe that's the reason I use them. I don't know. He came into my room and caught me wearing women's clothes. As I said, he removed part of my clothing and he told me as he laid me on the bed and told me that if I wanted to be a woman, he would gladly show me what a woman wants. Then he would say, you can be a woman and remember, this is what a woman wants and that you need to accept it now. I want to be clear that I was the only sibling he did this to. My mom had seven children, so she didn't think he was doing it only to me because he had her and knew he would be able to do it whenever he wanted to. I have always wanted to know why I was the only one of my siblings who did this to me and no one else. Still, I believe he knew he could get away with it, probably because mom did not believe it was happening to me until I was 16, so you can probably imagine what he did to me. I won't tell you about what he did to me. This went on for two years and it didn't matter if I was caught wearing women's or my male clothing. When he was ready, he did whatever he wanted to me. And I remember the day it all ended when I was 16 years old. It wasn't long after my birthday in October, and I decided that I was going to put an end to everything. By the way, this was not my first attempt to commit suicide. I tried to do it at eight earlier times in my life, but Brenda was there every time to stop me. So I made sure she was not there on my ninth attempt. Remember, the day was October 16th, 1979, and I was done with going to my conversion therapies. And I was done seeing that horrible thing between my legs every single day. It didn't matter if the panty girdle gave me a smooth look like I was a girl. It did not matter that my sister called it a congenital disability. I was tired of what my stepfather was doing to me. I decided that was it, and I would end my life. So I took the knife and sliced open my arm from almost starting from my armpit down to my wrist with a razor knife that you used to cut carpet knives that carpenters used. After I cut myself, I was bleeding out and lying on the floor. This is when my mom came by my room and found me bleeding. She began wrapping my arm tightly with a cloth. Then she did everything she could to get the bleeding to stop. And I don't remember who called for the ambulance to come, but my mom would not wait for it to come. She rushed me to the hospital in her car. And it's a good thing that she did because I would not have been alive, according to the doctors. Because if she did not do what she did, then I would have died. This is according to medical records that my psychiatrist showed me when I was 18 years old. And I was seeing a different psychiatrist anyway. 
Before that happened, it also discovered about what happened to me by stepdad. So while I was at the same time that when they saw what was happening to me, and they saw what my stepfather did to me, and they took what they discovered as evidence, and my stepdad was convicted for 40 years for what he did to me. Again, I don't like talking about sexual things, so I will not describe what happened to me. And this is also when the conversion therapy stopped and I didn't have any choice to where I wanted to go. Live, and I was decided that it would be with my dad because my mom could not deal with what happened to me. So I had no choice but to stay with my father. And, and at the time, he got married again. And his new wife, who was also my stepmother. Anyhow, she had a daughter and a son. So when forced to move in with my dad, I couldn't bring any of my female clothing. Because I knew if my mom found it, she would burn it again. So I gave it to my sister Brenda to hold on to until we could arrange it to have the ability to deliver to my dad's house without him knowing about it. Well, this took longer than I expected. So I began borrowing my stepsister's clothes and I started wearing her clothes. Yes, I was caught more times and I can't remember. I remember my dad telling me that I couldn't keep doing this anymore and he told my stepmom she told me I could no longer wear her daughter's clothes, but I knew I couldn't stop. I remember that I even wore her Girl Scout and cheerleader uniforms. I even wore a missionette's uniform, and I even wore her dresses and skirts too. Yes, I wore her undergarments, bras, panties, slips, and camisoles. Still, I did not touch her pantyhose because they were not big enough for me to wear and this is another issue that happens to girls who are tall like me, and I am tall. 513. I will not say six foot. Sorry. Anyway, Brenda and I have figured out a way to get my clothes to me because she knew that I was already wearing my stepsister's clothes. So not only did my stepmom know about it, Brenda knew about it, and so did my stepsister. And believe me, my stepsister was not happy about it, and Brenda knew I had, she had to get my clothes back to me so I would not get caught again wearing my stepsister's clothes. And I still was working as a teenager at the restaurant, so I was still getting an income. This is also when my dad decided that me and my brothers would be going to Christian school. And for the record, when I attended this Christian school, I was always on the A, not the B honor roll. And I remember the day that I should have skipped going to school that day. But I did not like missing school anyhow. One morning, when my brother should not have been driving, because he was too tired and really shouldn't be driving at all. And it wasn't long when he fell asleep at the wheel. And that is one thing about whenever you use cruise control on a car. It does not stop until you hit the brakes. He fell asleep at the wheel, and we hit a tree at approximately 45 mech. According to the police report, I was nearly paralyzed from the accident. I broke the seven column vertebrae in my neck. I had to wear a brace for eight months. The police did try to put my brother behind bars because of the accident, and they wanted to question me about it. Still, I decided I would not tell the police what they wanted to hear from me. And I knew that even though my brother had never approved of my dressing as a girl, I did not want to hurt my brother or have him arrested. After all, he should have been arrested because he was drinking the night before and he was underage. If I had been paralyzed, I would have ended my life because nobody in my family would help me become the woman I wanted to be. At the time, I knew nothing about transsexuals, and I did not know it was a transsexual, but I knew I wanted to get the surgery done. I didn't know anything about that until I found out about its even being possible, 
and I didn't know anything about Christine Jorgensen at this time in my life. And so I can continue wearing women's clothes any time that I could secretly. And this went on until I was 18 years old, and it was my 18th birthday, and my dad paid a prostitute to come into my room to try to and have sex with her. And he was going to have her show me how I should be glad that I should be as a man. And my father was very determined to change my mind about me wanting to be a woman. But this is not what happened with her anyway when she came into my bedroom naked and she said that when she said to me, what do you want from me? Which was not the right question for me because this is what I told her. I wanted to have your breast on my body. And I added, and your female equipment down below too, because I wanted to have my body of a woman. So what she had on her body, I wanted on my body after hearing my words. She was repulsed by my comments. So that's when she left me in my room alone and she continued to walk towards my dad and that she threw the money at my dad and then she told him to never call her again and said, I don't do queer people. And believe me, that my dad was so upset with me, with my actions. Like I said, he has already been punishing me, humiliating me, and embarrassed me every chance he had to try to get me to stop wearing women's clothing. But I never told him that. I never wanted to stop, and I knew I could never stop. I was not a cross-dresser. I knew it was more than just that, and I did not know at the time that I was a pre-op transsexual, which I later learned from my psychiatrist. So, the day after my 18th birthday, my father kicked me out of my home and said, if you want to be a woman, you are not welcome under my roof anymore. I was told the same by every family member that I was not welcome in their homes either and I was not to contact them either. My parents did not know that I and I stayed in contact with each other. And we did it. We had to do it secretly, because if my parents knew that she was talking to me, it would have been a problem for her. Like I said, she depended upon my parents to take care of her because she had cerebral palsy and she pretty much used a wheelchair and she depended upon them to take care of her. They probably could have got a caregiver to take care of her. Still, they liked controlling her and everything she did for a long time before meeting an evil man. She did not know how bad that man was, so it was not a good thing. I am getting ahead of myself again now. My parents did not know I had friends in Houston I could stay with. I did not stay long with this friend because he asked me to do things that I was very uncomfortable doing with any man. And this is probably because of what happened to me from what my stepfather did to me and that it was a strong possibility. But I know I was still stayed with my friend in the house and he wasn't happy with me declining him. And at the same time that I living with him, that when I met my psychiatrist and I remember talking to her, about everything going on in my life. And I told her that I really wanted to become a woman and I did not know how to go about it. And that during this time that she told me that she required me to do a chromosome test. And it was informed me that insurance probably would not covered. So when the test results came back, this is when I found out that my chromosomes is XXY and after she had seen the results, this is when she prescribed estradiol 2cc injections of estradiol for me once a week. And I would go have to a clinic to get my weekly dose. And she also referred me to my endocrinologist, which I always had my appointment with her every three months. And then this was the time I get noticed a little bit of changes happening to me, but it really was not much to be honest about it. Six months after my weekly injections, I saw the difference in my body and I loved it. 
This is when I got my attorney and filed my paperwork for my legal name and gender change in Texas. I have to say this. In Texas, it's tough to get the gender change on a name change request unless you have surgery already done. But this is why I had an attorney to do this for me. The only thing I had to do was say yes, your honor. This is what I want. My attorney handled everything else and my name was legally changed to Martha. And again, my job. So I was hired as Martha. And this boss hired me under that name Martha. Even though it was not legal, I got my paychecks in my old name, which he made sure that no one would ever find out about my old name. And he even said that, I will never tell anyone, not even my co-workers. And he knew about my family members, feelings about me becoming a woman. And he also told me that he know that I wish to God I could able to erase from minds of them and that they would not ever remember knowing who I was. And if he wished, that was only possible to change that memory from their minds. But my manager had no problem working with me to be Martha as a cook for the restaurant that I worked at. Everyone treated me as Martha and they did not know me as anything else. So when my name was legally changed and gender was legally changed, and remember when I showed my manager the paperwork, he began immediately making all of the changes to my employment records. And then he destroyed the old records. I remember when he put them in a shredder. It was a beautiful sight at this time. After that, I went to the Texas Department of Safety to get a new driver's license, which I had no problem getting. I got a female on it right away, and I went to the Social Security office and changed all that information. That took a bit longer because you had to wait your turn to be seen by an agent, but they changed everything there. All my documentation was changed except my Ohio birth record. You are inquiring how I ended up with an Ohio birth record. Well, while my mom was visiting her mom in Ohio, when she gave birth to me in Ohio anyhow, Ohio does not grant gender change, no matter if you have court order, because they don't honor the state of Texas or any other state except Ohio, and they don't care if it's been approved by Texas because it was not approved in Ohio. And I live my life in Texas until I would eventually move to Arizona to start my life over. I had different jobs over my life while I was in Texas. In the town, that was also the same time after my name was legally changed. And after this, when I met my adoptive mom anyhow, I knew that if I ever wanted to be a woman, then I wanted to learn everything about being a woman from a biological woman. And I had to, I had to ask a woman to help me. And I remember asking each different woman that I met, would you please be helpful? And if you teach me how to be a woman. And I know it was the third woman I asked and loved watching drag shows. And I can't tell you why biological women like to watch drag shows. And only reason I knew this information because of the talk that I have heard anyways. But I remember when I was asking Joanne my question and she said she would gladly teach me and she was also looking for a roommate at the time. So not only did I pay her to be my teacher, but I also paid her my part of the bills to stay with her. Not long after her training began, I passed as a woman. I was not clocked and I was not misgendered either. Still, it did take me two years to learn how to do everything as a woman does without thinking about how I need to do everything just like a woman. And it was natural to me. She began teaching me how to be a woman or a girl because she believed I needed to go through all three stages. First, I needed to learn how to be a girl. Then I learned how to be a lady. And then I learned how to be a woman. Now, the first thing she taught me was how to sit down as a girl smoothing your skirt or dress underneath you as you sat 
and you did not sit all the way back in a chair or on a couch. You would slide back on a couch after you sat. Still, when you first sat, you did not sit back. At least, that's what I was taught, and I've been sitting like that ever since. And then, she taught me how to behave like a girl. All mannerisms that a girl is taught at a young child's age. Hence, those mannerisms were girlish, and I had longer boyish mannerisms, because I was always a girl. She said this repeatedly to me because she wanted to instill this in me. Then we learned how to walk, and I wore a very tight pencil skirt and seven-inch heels all of the time to restrict my leg movements. You took shorter strides, and I also learned to walk in a straight line. And you will learn how much the way you need to walk is so much different than a man walks. Also, if you didn't walk properly like a woman, this usually would give you away. So remember, if you don't walk like a girl, then you shouldn't be surprised when you're clocked. And then I began to learn how to be a lady. And she started with how I needed to hold my purse when I was walking with it. When I, if, was setting it down, like at a table at a friend's house, or if I was at a restaurant, she taught me how to deal with how to put my purse on the table, not the floor, and what I should do with my purse. Or, if I am riding in a car with someone, and I am not the driver, that I need to put the purse on my lap and hold it with my hands over top of it. And these are just some of the things that she taught me. This is where she also taught me to say please, thank you, yes sir, yes ma'am, and so on, this is also where she told me that, when she said that, I had to make a promise to her, or she would stop my training right now, if I could not do it. So I inquired what she wanted me to do, because I did not want to stop this training. I wanted to know everything that I could know. She asked me to promise never to lie to anyone else. If someone asked me a question, I would always give the truth every single time, no matter what they asked me. I knew this was not a simple decision to make, but I knew I could not wait to give her an answer. And I told her, yes, I will not lie, ever. And I have not broken that word from her. After teaching me how to be a lady, she taught me how to be a woman, especially when I was in the workplace and public places, when I went shopping at a theater, or even a restaurant, and also needed to expect some men to treat me as a woman, and there would be times when some of them wouldn't. I needed to know this, because sometimes you feel uncomfortable, but I am always to be prim and proper. It doesn't matter how men are to me. At the beginning of my training, I feared being recognized as anything but being a woman. Still, it wasn't long after she trained me that I felt confident in who I was, especially when I used the bathroom and a manager didn't stop me. I remembered in the past how they would start by saying, since I wasn't a real woman, that I was not allowed to use the women's bathroom. But after I was taught by my adopted mom that this did happen to me, and after my training, I never got to stop again. No one questioned me about my gender. No one stared at me while I was in the bathroom. After training, I didn't hear a child asking her mom, mommy, if that was a boy or a girl. At the time, I did have a job while I was being taught and always did everything that I needed to do and this included me, to continue to pay my part of the bills and the agreed amount for her. It was after teaching me how to be a woman that little did I know that we would grow so close together. Together. She asked if I would mind if she started calling me. I would mind if she, if I became her daughter. And it was not long that when she was telling everyone that I was her daughter and I was telling everyone that she was my mom. 
and I will never forget the day that she redid my bedroom, because she wanted me to know how much she considered me her daughter. It was the day that I came home. After work, she said to me that she had redone my bedroom and knew that I would love it so much that when I opened my bedroom door, I was surprised because it was a lovely girl's bedroom set with a canopy bed. Everything was girly and it was all lavender and I was so touched by what she did. She said to me that my daughter deserved a room like this and like I said, we grew close together. I stayed with her until August 2005, when she passed it away, and I had to move from her house, which was an unfortunate day. It wasn't long after she passed away before I decided to change jobs. I moved from Houston and went to work in my small town, the same small town that I was raised in. I saw the job listing for the position and I was hired. I worked for this factory as a purchasing assistant. They did not know that I was not a biological female. They never asked me, and they never questioned me. I worked there for about 18 months before the company's CEO approached me and asked me for a date. I knew that this day would happen because all the girls in the office told me that that was expected of me, and that if I did not do it, they would fire me. They were right, because after I said no to him, because I knew I was not biological, I knew that I never could go out on a date with him, so by saying no, I was fired. His exact words were, insubordination, you're fired. Hence, I decided to move back to Houston and get my apartment with no roommates this time. So, I got another job. It was not the greatest job, but it paid the bills. It wasn't long after that that I started looking into a roommate situation, and I knew they all had to be women in that apartment, just like I was again. I did not have my surgeries, and they never knew that I wasn't biological, and they did walk in on me when I was taking showers. By this time, my hormones have shrunk me. You know what? even smaller than what it was, and I never got a hard-on ever in my life, including when my stepfather did what he did to me. I know that may shock you, but it's the truth. Anyhow, it was only two years that I could live with them before I had to get my own place again because I could not stand them bring their boyfriends into the house for the first year, and they were not quiet about that but it was the second year that really got to me because they started eating my food and not replacing it. And that was, they were allowing different people in our home at all hours of the night. And I really felt uncomfortable with these people in the house, but because I knew they were my roommates, friends, that I really could not say anything about it. But when it came to them eating my food, that was one of the arrangements that we had to make, was that we did not touch anybody. Food without asking. First, well, they did not do this. I knew. I had to move out, and I had to wait. My lease was up before. I could move out. Because I was still under the contract of the apartment complex. And I could not break the lease. But believe me, I was ready to go when I could, and I did, knew that. This was the last time that ever had any roommate. I knew I had to, had a place for myself, with nobody else living with me. Then I got a job at company that made computers parts as a quality control inspector, and I worked there approximately three years before I moved on to my final job, before I left for Bangkok. And I worked as a security officer for a well-known company that I want to mention, but I can't anyhow. I worked there approximately two years before. I knew I was leaving the United States to become the woman that I want it to be, physically, and I had already had all of letters of recommendation sent to my surgeon ahead of time. 
and not only did my psychiatrist write that letter of approval, but so did my primary doctor and my endocrinologist. So when I arrived there at midnight in Bangkok, and before I arrived that informed not to eat anything after midnight, because they would be taking me to the hospital that morning. That was June 14th, 2002. It was approximately 6 a.m. in the morning when they came to pick me up from the hotel where I stayed at. By the way, my adoptive mom went with me and she stayed at the hotel the whole time that I was there in the hospital. And when I was in the hospital, she came to the hospital every day to see me. But I do want to add, she wasn't with me on that day that I had to pay for everything in advance. And I remember that morning very well. I was talking to the doctor's staff, and while I was there at office, he examined me and weighed me on a scale, because if you weighed over 200 pounds, then you did not get your surgery done. He would not do it, and I was under 200 pounds. And that's then his staff came to see me and told him that I have paid him all of the money for my surgeries, my breast implants, and my vaginoplasty. After I paid for everything, I was then taken to the hospital where they did two enemas on me to make sure that I was cleaned out before I was taken to the operating room that morning. That's when my adoptive mom was in the room with me. I did not know that she was picked up by an office staff member from the doctor's office and brought to the hospital. It was approximately 9 a.m. Bangkok time that I was taken to the operating room. That's when I met my anesthesiologist who put me under and my surgeon began working on me. It was 3 p.m. when I started to wake up after my surgeries. That's when I saw my adopted mom, Joanne, in my room, smiling, and she was so happy for me. I can tell you one thing about breast implants. Getting out of bed with them initially is very hard until you are used to them. Also, the most comfortable bra I ever wore was a Wacoal bra with a soft cup. I wore this bra for approximately four days before I could remove it, and it was the most comfortable one I ever wore. I know that some women will say when they get home from a hard day at work, I can't wait to take their bra off because they made a comfortable one. You did not have that feeling. Even though I wanted to see my surgeon's work, I asked for a mirror, and since the packing was all around, it did not let me see what I wanted to see. But that was removed after the next day. And then, that's when they also removed the catheter from me. And I remember that day very well. It was the first I peed, and I did have some pain, but this was the only time I experienced any kind of pain. Whether I was on any pain medication or not, I do not know, but this is also when I got to see it with a mirror, and it was the best sight I could ever see. I had female equipment just like any other woman, and the next day, my surgeon showed me how to dilate properly. I needed to do this four to five times every day for approximately 15 to 20 minutes, and I needed to continue doing this when I returned to America. I needed to consult my gynecologist every six months. She told me when I needed to go up on the size of my dilators and that I should get six. At least I did. I was only there in Bangkok until June 25th. That's when my surgeon told me that I could go back to America, and he was surprised at how fast I healed because some don't heal so quickly. He was surprised. I was his first woman who healed so fast and he believed me. If I weren't healed, then my surgeon would not let me go home until I was ready to go home, but I was ready to go home. And he had no problem with that. It wasn't long after I was cleared to go back to America. I was thrilled to be back in the United States. Soon after that, my sister and adoptive mom, Joanne, decided to make my day even more special. Hence, they gave me the first birthday party of my life at age zero, 
and everything at that birthday party said congratulations. It's a girl. This was also when my parents came to my birthday party, and one of my aunts came because Brenda contacted my family members. Still, they were the only ones that came at this time. Nobody else in my family believed my sister, and some did not care. It didn't make a difference to them, so they did not come, and they have been out of my life. Is there a loss? And my parents and my aunt only came because my surgeries were complete. I want to make it clear that you were supportive of me. For the first time, my dad called me his daughter. Still, my mom did not at this time, but later she would, and my aunt considered me her niece on that day. And I enjoyed the day not long after that because I was still living in Houston. So I decided that I would try to reach out to the community, and this is where I met some cross-dressers and their wives. And I learned a lot about them, not only the husbands and wives, but their stories. They told me how they found out about their husbands. The only thing they did, not like they were not told before they got married, and they felt like this was a lie, a deception. But after they were caught, their husbands came clean about it, and it did not happen right away for most of them, that the wives accepted them as cross-dressers and most of them actually help their husbands. But there is very few wives when they find out about their husbands. Then they would get divorce. Someone because they didn't want to be married to a cross-dresser. It's sad, but it does happen. I have to say, their biggest concern after that, then the wives' concerns. Is this only a part-time thing? Or do they want to go on to become women? because most of them do not want a lesbian relationship with someone that does want to surgery, but they would be their friend, but they could not stay married to them. But I have heard stories where husbands and wives stay together, even after there has been got. Sex, reassignment surgery done. It's rare, but the only problem the wives had about their husband is what I have said already. But I will say it again, because it's very important to be honest with your girlfriend, wife, mom, or sister about cross-dressing because they were not upfront and honest with them until they were caught by them. That is when they felt that they were deceived and lied to. And believe me, women do not take well to being deceived by someone. But I also understand the fear that cross-dressing husbands have, and they fear that their wives will not understand them. And I remember that the wives would even ask me once, which one of the guys, or should they say girls? Anyways, they would say to me, which one of them is my husband? I giggled and said, I am not married. I'm just here trying to give support to other cross-dressers. They believed that I was a biological female, even though I did have my surgeries done at that time. Still, not long after that, I just said there was no way I could keep trying to avoid people who knew the old me. I knew that I had to leave Texas because I remember when a good friend of mine who knew me from my childhood slipped up one day and he called me my old name and was so glad that no one heard it. I quietly whispered in his ear and reminded him I said that you can't say that name ever, and this is when I decided I would have to leave Texas and start my life over again as Martha, because the older adult was dead. That person does not exist anymore. I know that most of my family members do not believe this. Still, they have been out of my life for a long time. It was their decision, not mine, that I was not welcome in their homes or their lives. And this is also when I found out about my sister getting married to an evil man. He was like Warren Jeffs. I don't know if you know who it was or not, but it was an occult leader. And they, once you were in the compound, 
you were forced you to do everything that they told you to do, and you, and did it without question, and you very rarely could have a visitor come and take you off of the compound, because you had to have permission ahead of time for this to happen. Well, me, and that's when I ask a friend who is a man, do you help me? And we began our plans and saw Brenda knew those plans, so with Brenda knowledge of what was happened on that day, and that everything was all set to go. And can't explain why I got bad feeling about getting the approval from the head person at the compound on that day. But it was a woman, not a man in charge. So that is probably why no red flags were raised to her, and she didn't suspected nothing out of ordinary, because if she knew what we were going to do, she wouldn't have allowed Us to leave the compound. And so, when we arrived, and we answered all of her questions, we loaded her wheelchair, and she was, carried her, and put her inside the truck. And we left the compound without giving them any alerts, or raising any red flags. And after we came to rescue my sister from her life that she was now living, I had already bought the plane tickets for the day that, and we knew we were going to leave Texas, and not planning on ever coming back, and she was going to live with me now, and I was going to take care of her, and she knew that we would never go back to Texas, and I can tell you that we lived in fear that they would come looking for us, but they never did come looking for us, or they never found us, and before this plan was in action, I became certified to be her caregiver, and even took Article 9 training, because she was with cerebral palsy, and you had to have that training to be a caregiver in the state of Arizona. We told everyone that we were sisters, and nobody questioned me about my true identity, and I can tell you, nobody knew about me, and as far my sister was concerned, that have been was a biological female since the day I was born. And she first told me that when I was five years old, and she also said, I will always be her sister, I will never be her brother, and I never was, and forever, I will be a woman, and I was never anything else but a woman. And I need it to remember this. And just like my adopted mom, she stayed with me until she died, December 2015, and I tried to do CPR to bring her back, but I couldn't do it. And I went into a very dark, deep depression. In between. This time, I had to go to a mental hospital a little while after that. I... I had a 14-year-old girl come up to me because I was staying with the family at that time. Because I was taking care of her uncle as a caregiver. I almost forgot my brother Michael. He was killed underneath a car while he was working on it in 1991, getting back to my daughter. I remember the day that she, to be her mom, because her mom didn't love her anymore. It wasn't long after her request that I talked to her mom about this. We agreed to go to the courthouse, and we both signed legal guardianship papers over to me, and she became my daughter, and it wasn't long before she got married, who later got divorced. And right now, I am currently living with my son-in-law. And after they divorced, that's when she moved away, and she really has not contacted me since. So I have been staying with him all these years, again. He thinks, and so does everyone else. That knows me, believes I am a biological woman, and nobody has never questioned me about it, and everyone still believe me, that I am biological. And I can tell you, if they knew about me, I wouldn't even have a place to live, because I have heard some of the comments that come out of my son-in-law's mouth about, he feels, about LGBTQ people. So, if he knew that, I wasn't a real woman, and I don't remember how many times about the language he used when he talked about LGBTQ people. And it was not good so I now attend groups after Brenda died. It devastated me. So now I take medication to help my anxiety and depression. I remember the day I saw my medical records after they were read to me. 
It was on June 22, 2023, after the doctor read my medical history to me. And that's when she went into detail about my surgeries. She began by saying that on September 18, 2016, I had my gallbladder and appendix removed on October 16, 2018. I had my cataract surgery, which is now in my medical records. Then she said that I had a total hysterectomy done on the same day that I knew where I was on this date. And I was not in Houston, Texas. I was in Bangkok, Thailand, having my sex reassignment surgery done and breast implants done. But there it was in my medical records, saying that on June 14, 2002, I had a total hysterectomy done in Houston, Texas, at a hospital done by another surgeon. I will not say the name of the hospital or the surgeon's name because I do not want it posted in the story. I will also let you know that I will never change or tell them about my record that they are not correct. Still, they'll never hear from my mouth and I will not forget that day when my doctor read to me and I have to say, if I had not seen it myself, I would not have believed it then I would not have believed it, but I did see it, and I don't know if you know what that means. So, I will tell you, it means that I am considered a biological female, because only a biological female can have a total hysterectomy done, but that's exactly what is in my medical records. I can also tell you, six months after my surgeries was completed, I was examined by my gynecologist, and she told me if I did not disclose to her that I was not a transsexual, she would not have known until she did an exam on me, because my surgeon did that good of a job, and yes, I see my gynecologist every six months, but I see my endocrinologist every eight weeks also. They both draw blood and run labs on me. Every time I remember when I saw them, the first time they both drew blood at each appointment, and when they got back, the results they told, that my body now produce enough estrogen on its own, that I did not need to take any kind of blockers or estradiol anymore. Also, and also during this time, that I do not have any hair growth on my legs, arms, or underarms. And I never had any hair on my chest ever, or my back, which I have heard that some transsexuals, they have do some, and as for my face, I have a little bit of peach fuzz. And I've been told everyone is different, and that they knew some women that have more hair on their face than I did, and they are biological. And this might sound strange to some people, but I made a promise to myself after I turned 18. I swore to God that I would do everything in my power to never wear another pair of pants, shorts, leggings, or anything like pants ever again. So now I only wear dresses and skirts. And I do remember. There was one day when I had to wear a pantsuit one time in my life. And but believe me, it was totally feminine. And the boss was coming down from Dallas to tour of the plant. And it was policy of the factory that no dresses or skirts were allowed inside the plant. For safety reasons, I have never wore that pantsuit ever again, and I never will wear anything like a pair of pants ever again. I will now stay with wearing my dresses and skirts only. I'm not saying I don't wear a bikini, because I do, and it was one of my jobs that I had before I got my surgery. I was a certified lifeguard. Again, nobody there knew that I was not a biological female again. I do not tell anyone about myself and will not risk it. I know this might upset a few people too, and I do not use the words trans, transgender, transsexual, or non-biological female to describe myself. I am a woman, 1000%. All women and my adoptive sisters, I hope you like it because it's all true. I do not lie. I made this promise to my adoptive mom a long time ago, but I would appreciate your thoughts about it.